Well, the first of that was the surviving commandant of 1916, Thomas Ash, who was in charge of the Fingalian Battalion of 1916. And on his way in from Ashbourne, he was arrested. He spent time in five different prisons until in the Woodyard of Mountjoy Jail, where Thomas Ash decided that he would go on hunger strike. They force fed him and busted his gullet, rushed him to the Mata Hospital, where that he died after five days in the Mata Hospital of the ill treatment that was given to him. And Thomas Ash of 1917, who was a leader of 1916, led us with that message. Our oh Lord, let me carry your cross for Ireland. And that was Fitzgerald and Murphy and Terence McSweeney. And Terence McSweeney's name outshadowed the other two, but they died as brutal and as horrible as death as McSweeney. And McSweeney was, was taken out of Ireland over to England, where there in Brixton Prison, that he decided that he would go on hunger strike. And I'm going on hunger strike. I'm going on hunger strike. He called his sister Mary and he told her that he would die for the Republic, the ex Lord Mayor of Cork. And then the third period of hunger strike happened to be the Civil War period of Andy Sullivan, Dennis Barry, and Joseph Whitty. Um, they died in the Civil War period in under the Cosgrave government. And in dying in under the Cosgrave government, they died in a concentration camp. Two of them died in a concentration camp. While Dennis Barry died in Mountjoy Jail. And they were allowed to die in underneath an Irish government. There were men who had fought around a lot, two of them uh, around Cork an awful lot, and then the Sparry around Wexford. Um, the Cosgrave government let them die. And then we come along to the, to the fourth period of hunger strike which happened to be 1940, when Tony Darcy and Sean McNeila were prisoners of war in Mountjoy Jail, and under uh, the Fianna Fáil government. And they went on hunger strike, the two of them, and after a few couple of weeks, a few weeks on a hunger strike, they were moved to Brickens Military Hospital, where there the two of them died in Brickens hospital. A story was told that as Jack McNeela was dying he shouted Tony where are you Tony and Tony struggled out of bed to assist him and Tony got a merciful fall which ended his life. He only lived a couple of days after and the two of them were let die in 1940 in Brickens Military Hospital and under the Fianna Fáil de Valera government. And then, in 1946, we come into Sean McCaughey from Belfast, who had arrested Stephen Hayes, the informer, the paid informer, paid by Fianna Fáil, and along with Charlie McLeod, Liam Rice, Peter Flynn, who arrested him in Belfast, and three of them were sentenced to 14 years of imprisonment. After Seven year Mukahi was fed up and he went on hunger strike and then he went on thirst hunger strike and he was allowed to die in under the Fianna Fáil government. And under that Fianna Fáil government he was allowed to die. And then we come along to 1974 to that grand lad Mukahan from AO from AO and um, he was brutally ill-treated also because each time they would say we're giving you the rights 
and then we're moving you to another prison. And when he got to another prison, the governor of that prison told him, you have no rights. So he was shifted again and told he was going to get rights. And when he got to the other prison, he was told there was no rights. He was perhaps force fed in a way and um, he died from pneumonia from the effects of hunger strike although he died on hunger strike but through ill treatment of Mokahan and we got him home and we brought him to Dublin and bringing him to Dublin we brought him home to his beloved May O to Balana where we buried him in it brings me to 1976 to Frank Stagg. Frank Stagg, a beautiful looking round face man and I knew him and he was a man that you'd love to be with in this company but he was arrested in England and there he went on a hunger strike because he wouldn't give no rights. He went on hunger strike. And on going on hunger strike, he died on hunger strike. We made arrangements to bring his remains home and to bury him below in his beloved League Cemetery in Ballina, along with Mokahan. But the orders came from Fine Gael and Labour a Paddy Cooney, who was Minister of Justice at the time, and gave their special branch the orders to capture the body. Now, he was supposed to come down on the Dublin airport, and a few of us went to the Dublin airport to receive his remains. And the next thing was, Mrs. Stagg was told that the coffin had gone on to the Shannon. The special branch took the coffin out of the plane and taking it out of the plane they brought it to a mortuary and God knows what happened in that mortuary and next thing was it was taken to Leek Cemetery onto a hill and buried into an unmarked grave Frank Stagg should the treatment to be given to a man who gave his life for his country and for that man to be treated in so much brutal manner by by the coalition government of Fine Gael and Labour and Labour should have been ashamed of themselves to allow that to happen to allow that to happen and he was buried up on a hill Leek Cemetery and for two years the special branch was guarded was a guard on that grave for two years an armed special branch um, when there was a change of government the, they were taken away from it the special branch from the grave and the soldiers of the Irish Republican Army dug down and took them out of it and buried them in the Republican plot along with McGohan and Tobins and those others the great Frank Stagg Oh, brutally ill-treated was his remains. Brutally ill-treated was his remains. 1981 was an awful year of the ten supreme young men that any government would be very proud of them. The way they stood up for the, unity, for the unification of that country. And when... I, along with Charlie Medlaid, Rice, we went to see Hahi. And we asked Hahi to intervene, to stop Maggie Thatcher from letting these men die. The words he used was, there is nothing I can do, which he could have done it, but he didn't do it. But his, his background of his own father was an awful thing as well but they died the ten young men 
and throughout the world there's great respects and the streets and roads called after some of those hunger strikers and we had Bobby Sands and Francis Hughes and Ray McCreesh and Patty O'Hara and John McDonnell, Martin Horson and Kevin Lynch and Kieran Doherty, Thomas McElwee and Mickey Devine. Mickey was better known as Red Mick. And Red Mick, Devine, that I knew that man. Red Mick was born in the most published part of Europe. And you had to go to Springtown Camp to see that poverty. There were huts left behind by the Americans when they occupied a part of my country. And I saw that conditions myself. And Mickey was a child who was reared in that environment. And as he grew, he convicted wrongfully twice. And then he was arrested again. And he was in the Long Kesh with Bobby Sands and Ray McCreesh and Patsy and those others. Where he followed them on hunger strike. And he was the last of the hunger strikes. Red Mickey Devine. And you never knew should the nicest man as what Red Mickey was. You could always talk to him and he would talk to you politely and nicely. And he liked the rest of the, his comrades died for the freedom of Ireland, for the unification of his country and for the welfare of his people. And uh, you, uh, you wrote a poem, didn't you know, uh, about, about, <coughs> about this period? In my own words, or nobody else's words, for a thousand years the Irish mind has only known one definition. It is a definition of freedom, not a geographical definition of freedom, not a freedom of a creed, not a creed of a class, not a freedom for the section, but a freedom for all. They have cherished that freedom more than wealth, more than happiness, more than sickness, more than others. They have cherished that freedom. They have cherished that freedom with their lives and let there be no mistake about it. And let there be no mistake about it. They cherish that freedom with their lives. <laughs>